This is our pop culture and theology series. We started it a few months ago with talking about the Legend of Zelda video game series and its connection to theology. And we have followed it up with fantasy book series and music and our latest installment you're joining us for tonight, in which we talk about the giant extended comic book universe adapted over the past decades to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And I have Director of Religious Education, Amber Kelly here. I'm Assistant Director of Religious Education, Colin Wolf, And we are going to chat about this through a, a series of questions that explore that connection. So, Ember, thank you for leading this and for hosting us here to talk about this conversation tonight. How are you doing? I'm doing really good. I really love these pop culture and theologies. Uh, I, uh, I'm a little bit of a, of a sucker for them. I uh, in my previous work in a youth group, I ran a Star Wars and theology curriculum for a few months at, at, at my youth group, and it was uh, culminated in going to see The Force Awakens at the opening night. And so that's where this whole idea for these pop culture and theologies first kind of started. And, you know, they've, I, I'm really happy with uh, how they've been going here. We had, like I said, the wonderful music and theology just, uh, gosh, that only feels like a few weeks ago now. Uh, and... We thought that it would be good to hit on something that lots of folks are talking about right now because we just had, not too long ago, it feels like many moons ago now, but uh, we just had WandaVision uh, rap. And then we also very, very more recently had uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier rap. And then now next month we have uh, Loki coming out. And so there is an abundance of Marvel things coming out this year. And so as part of the, the fun of having this pop culture and theology is a regular offering for our religious education is that we can kind of quickly pivot to talk about something that's maybe getting a lot of exposure in in the regular in the world media right now and uh, I think it's it's pretty much impossible to escape Marvel and to escape Disney at this point uh, even if one doesn't watch Marvel movies they probably interacted with Disney as a wider whole and so uh, we, we thought that there's a lot of really great uh, philosophical and theological themes to look at here in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And so we will be mostly focusing on the movies. We will talk a little bit about the TV shows at the end. We'll, we have some knowledge of, of the comic books that will probably not be the hugely grounding feature of our discussion. So we'll probably be kind of talking about some of the things that happen in the various movies. And so uh, with that, I think that we can officially begin. All right. So Ember, what, what is this cultural obsession with these great exemplary standout figures with the, the Superman prototype? What, what, is, what is it that sustains that for so many decades and so many different iterations? I think there's a lot of angles that you could really look at this with. Um, I think one thing that's become obvious in the last year in the pandemic is the individualism in our society. And I think that uh, individualism breeds an obsession with the super individual, the one who has figured out how to uh, deal with all of the problems, any absurd uh, thing that might happen, uh, such as an alien invasion. Uh, and so I think that that to some level, it's this uh, cultural obsession with the, the superpowered individual that, that folks perhaps maybe uh, wish that they could have that level of exceptionalism in their life. Uh, I think that there's, there's some level of that. And I also think that a lot of our narratives as a society, like especially I, I'm, I'm a history nerd, uh, and especially like when we're looking at history, they often focus on like the role of uh, it's it's called the great man theory like that, that there's one leader and because of that one leader uh everything happened and so maybe they hold up somebody like napoleon or hitler or someone like fdr even with world war ii that these are these great leaders that have this exceptional ability and uh people are we're used to that narrative as a as a way of interacting with history and so when we start coming up with like our own cultural myths uh which a lot of these comic books are is it's kind of uh, America's way of grappling for some some new creation of culture uh, and 
so we we latch onto these as like these are these figures who can help move history and like how do we do this uh and so um i think those are two ways that like individualism really really fuels that i don't think that's an inherently bad thing i think it's great for us to have like examples um as someone who grew up in the christian tradition like that's you know uh, one of the the theories of uh, there's multiple theories about why did jesus have to die on the cross uh, and one of those theories is that like he did it to set an example and like that like you know some people have other like there's like five or six different ways that it's, it's interpreted but that was one of the theories in the early church of, of the early christian church that um that there was a um you know this it was just that he's showing us how to sacrifice and so you know it, there is a theological tradition of like this idea of uh whether it's jesus or like thinking back to like greek mythology that these gods are giving us this example to follow um and so like it's it's not an inherently bad thing to to have this individual person to strive for but i do think that uh uh america american cultures and western culture in general's tendency towards individualism makes this idea of like the super person uh all that more appealing do you have any uh thoughts on why you think that people like superheroes so much yeah i mean i i agree with your main points i think there's an interesting continuum from sort of a secular individualism to the theological point that you were making uh, all the different expressions of specialness in the superhero world and how uh, some of them are total happenstance an accident where uh, the the appeal of the character is a person that otherwise is mortal and generic who stumbles on a springboard to greatness and then there are the characters whose you know, supposed greatness is an extension of something that already made them special, whether they were a super scientist or uh, inherited rank as a, a god or a demigod or royalty, for instance. And so there are these superpowers that come as a, an extension of something that could already be grasped or could already happen within the mortal sphere. And then there are superpowers that aren't an extension of mortality uh, or of, of normal circumstances, but that could be visited upon any normal person that happened to be in the right place at the right time. And of course their personalities and their other, you know, domestic and professional circumstances narratively and dramatically will happen to conduce to that superpower as well, because that's just the nature of storytelling. But yeah, that uh, there's a, there's a graded scale in the ways in which this, the exemplary quality of these individuals can be, can be seen as, uh, as, an, as an extension of the mundane or as a total break with the mundane and how much of it we credit to who they were in the first place. Well, I mean, and you, if you break down, like, you know, I'm, I'm like cataloging all of the MCU movies in my head. I'm like, okay, Iron Man became a superhero because he's rich. Um, also, he was a good inventor, but like, the tech you know, genius, it was, right? <laughs> it was, it was, it was able to, he was able to have all of that technology because of the, of his resources. Um, Thor inherited the power, but then loses, but then gains it back by becoming worthy, you know. Uh, but then, uh, you know, like the maybe an example that's more about like human frailty and like this improving on uh, the, the what's within a person is is Captain America, uh, or even maybe a later case, Doctor Strange. Uh, but especially Captain America, you have this, you know, very um, small and thin and computer edited Chris Evans in the. <laughs> early parts of the movie uh who looks like you know he'd someone could just literally walk into him and knock him over probably uh but then you know he gets this the serum that brings out like the truth in people so in red skull it's brought out this, this evilness but because the the doctor sees that he's like this person who's willing to sacrifice then he thinks that he is the one who is deserving of of this superpower uh and so you know, I think that we also like superheroes because they do the things we can't, um, but that that helps us kind of grapple with with human frailty, like gra grapple with mortality in a way that we um, we see these these uh, figures who can most of the time avoid death. Uh, you know, we uh, have 
in the overall series a very low permanently dead count. Um, uh, I, I, it's hard to even count how many are people, how many main characters are officially dead. Um, do you, I'm trying to think through it because, you know, spoilers, but, you know, there's most of them have had some sort of comeback or some sort of, at the very least, still having a movie coming out this year about them that's maybe a look into the past, but the character still hasn't quite left us, even if they've, they've left us, like Black Widow um, with the movie coming out this year. So they, they seem to have this, this invincibility uh, narratively as well in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Um, can, I'm trying to think, Colin, can you think of anybody who's dead, dead, forever dead? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, well, if, and if I could, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, affirm it with any confidence because there's time yet, you know, and that's one, one of the, one of the, I guess, uh, sort of emulations of, of kind of a theologic power that is in the comic book storytelling medium and increasingly the movie storytelling medium uh, intrinsically is this idea to break any rules that that need to be broken in order to sustain the entertainment um and so we we can even go so far as resurrecting a franchise without resurrecting the particular character design the particular actor that embodied that that hero so 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 often now we are seeing complete resets where uh you know the the destruction that the particular team or or incarnation of the hero experiences is not to be backpedaled on it's gotten too uh you know too decisive uh, so we just reset completely and say oh this is an alternate timeline uh, we, we we recast this as a different interpretation of of the myth and that's how myth works you know um so so resurrection and martyrdom not only is uh is is uh, flexibly exercised within any given continuous story or timeline but we can break with a given timeline transfer the same intellectual properties and start over completely um kind of meta narratively so that's uh yeah but but going, going back to your your uh, statement about uh, appreciating that they can do things that we can't uh, i mean what do you think about that that tension that that distinction between ways of idolizing these characters uh, how often are we looking for a protector who can shoulder those burdens how often are we wanting to project ourselves into them you know which which ones do we nominate as our favorites and is that because we see ourselves in them or is how much of it is purely aspirational or we see them as a buffer between us and uh, the griefs that are all too real in our plane of existence what do you think oh gosh i don't i feel like that one's really gonna vary by the person and by the superhero um you know like i i have no desire to be like iron man like, sure, I guess I maybe wish I was a little bit more inventive, but uh, <laughs> until the end there, he was never too too appealing to me. I really didn't watch any of the Iron Man movies more than the one time just to say that I had watched them in the, in the, in the stream. Uh, but at the same time, you know, like I, you know, I, I find myself drawn to other ones really unexpectedly. Like I did not expect to like Captain Marvel that much, but uh, ended up watching it quite a few times or... Um, I think most folks who know me perhaps know that I am not the most traditionally patriotic person, <laughs> um, but yet I, I enjoy a good Captain America story. Uh, so, you know, I think that, that there is some level that we find ourselves, you know, kind of wishing that we could, I, don't know, I, I, I think I lean towards that interpretation that, 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 that people see themselves in that and see themselves wanting to like reach that exemplar more, more often than like just thinking like it's nice to like imagine that there are people out there that protect us. I mean, that being said, uh, one could look at, especially with the case of Captain Marvel, the heavy defense department spending that was used to influence some of the choices of the script uh, towards uh, very positive portrayals of the US Air Force. Um, and so perhaps they, they are at the same time really trying to maybe not so obviously instill in us these, um, hey, you're safe, we got you. The superheroes are on our side. We are the superheroes of the US Army. <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah, I think that, um, that there's a level of that. And I, you know, I can't help but think about, some, as somebody who grew up, um, I, I suppose growing up in 
the, the closet as a trans woman, like considering the military is a pretty, pretty normal path. Um, it's the, the hyper-masculine place to, to try and avoid coming out of the closet. Uh, and, you know, so I was, uh, I was very into like military information. There was always talk of like, how do we, you know, have these super soldiers? Like, what can we do to make these super soldiers like a real thing? Uh, so like, I think that, that there is some level that we're trying to translate some of these concepts into our real world to help us like feel more safe, whatever that, that safety means. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think um, superheroes, the unkillable, the unkillable Loki. Um, I mean, but also, gosh, I suppose as we even just consider this, these first couple things that we've pondered, what officially marks them as a hero versus a villain in the movie? Um, you know, we, we have someone like Loki who in the first is kind of just like a very casual villain. Uh, and, but then in the original Avengers, he's the villain, like he's trying to take over the whole planet. Uh, but then by, you know, Thor Ragnarok by uh, Avengers, he is this a wholesome, like, maybe not wholesome, I guess that's probably stretching a little bit too far. Um, Tom, Tom Hiddleston would be angry at me. <laughs> um, but, you know, he's, he's this figure who is willing to sacrifice himself for like the greater good. So like, where is the line between villain and hero? Where is the line between good and bad? I, it's a question that I think we grapple with in real life too. Um, where, where, where do you think that Loki became a hero, Colin? <laughs> I, uh, I mean, I think that the case could still be made that um, that he didn't successfully fully make that transition, and that uh, you know the the last place that I saw him anyway was you know uh, could generously be described as kind of a a, a last ditch parting effort to <laughs> to begin to make up for the destruction for which he was already responsible. Um, and you know, a, a character like that is is already kind of uh, is interesting because I mean, we a, a god of mischief. You know, we we are all we are already inclined to think of the the havoc he wreaks as somehow having a charming quality to it, as as somehow being a you know a, a setup for a punchline. And when he fails, he fails quite pathetically, but usually has left, you know, bloodiness in his wake already. And so we are sort of we're trained not to take the disaster he incites too seriously from the outset. Um, and that almost makes me uh, more reluctant to take the story's cue um, when we're told to, you know, give him a grand and affectionate send off because his last act was you know, attempting to dethrone another wannabe overlord. Um, I, and I, I'm seeing real quick in the in the chat or a, a comment that people have always resurrected their cultural heroes story wise before Marvel. And of course, yes, that's, that's absolutely the tr true. For instance. Um, the you know the Greek dramatists had many different iterations of the doings of those pantheons. The names get changed and transferred to Roman poets and and uh, and also di dialogue writers. Um, I think that's something that is different about the comic and movie approach to what has often been described as a, a contemporary mythology that is this pantheon of superheroes. Uh, the serial format. The uh, the consumerism that comes with you know uh, waiting constantly for the next direct installment that is supposed to contiguously follow um, from the previously the previous one. Um, so we don't we don't have quite the same. Um, there isn't quite the same sense that there is an an open uh, myth time that is. Uh, constantly fertile, uh, constantly unending. There's a rough chronology. You know, the the fall of Ilium, uh, being uh, you know a one decisive landmark, for instance. Um, there isn't there isn't quite quite a sense that to either side of major landmarks like that. There's this kind of open chronology where uh, cause and effect and genealogy is sort of this flexible territory. Right now, these are intellectual properties, and any given timeline. Is still controlled by a very top-down process. You know how it's disseminated, um, what the official 
canonical expression of these characters that can get recycled is in any given any given decade for any given generation. Um, but yes, that is that is an important point to point to note that uh, Marvel did not invent that yes. storytelling well, technique. It's yes. and it's almost like I, 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 as you were saying that I couldn't help but think that it's kind of like the, the ancient mythologies combined with like the serial novel of like the the 1800s 1900s early 1900s where it was these released every week released every uh every, well, you know once every few months uh come come and get the latest part to find out what happened to your favorite character uh the comics very much took over that kind of the same thing and then now the cinematic universe has as well when i mean i think this seems like a good moment to i know we had um uh m- had down as one of our things to reflect a little bit on the fact that you have a Norse god as um, one of the main figures. I would like to, to let folks know, uh, both on the future YouTube and in the room here, that according to Ancestry.com, I am distantly related to Thor. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm maybe a little biased in the favor of Thor, uh, as he is a, a very, very distant uh, great, 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 great grandfather. Um, <laughs> um, you know, so I think it, it, it's... <laughs> Come on, Colin. You, it's I the, know that... the you humorist approach that Thor is Thor is uh, based in real human lords that then uh, then hey. had had legend descended from their great exploits. According to Ancestry.com, how could they ever be wrong on Ancestry.com? <laughs> <laughs> so. Like it's it's but it's interesting though that they do you know you, you talk about the humanist approach of understanding these figures we have the Marvel you, approach to you, you sorry you humorist was what I was oh, saying. humorist you you uh, no, you, you humorist uh, the the theory uh, that myths are that myths are descended from uh, actual real people traceable yes. real right I mean it's it's uh, I mean Arthurian legend is a is a template to which that approach has yeah. been applied a lot and and some people have extended it even to the Norse pantheon um, and and other world religions and so it's just that sounded that sounded like yeah. uh, <laughs> like that that uh, source of, of pedigree was was relying on that assumption yeah. someone somewhere along the line clearly plugged all of this information into into there and so they believed they believed it at least <laughs> um, so I will choose to believe it as well. So, I mean, so we have a literal um, God, you know, and he calls himself that in, in the, you know, so what, when you have these very just um, maybe some that come to their powers, especially maybe some that um, buy their powers, but then you also have this literal Norse God and like this whole pantheon uh, that, you know, he's got his father, he's got Loki, he's got his warrior friends, they, um, have the world tree and like I, I remember at the time I, I feel like I was very much in the minority of, of folks that liked Thor in in the beginning uh, but like and in the end you couldn't have had these massive like adventures that took a place across the galaxy if you didn't have something like Thor to kind of set the stage for that absurd as well uh, like that okay like sure we've had Iron Man we've had Captain America now also we're going to have Thor, um, who lives on this golden world, but who gets exiled to, to Earth. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's interesting that they literally also do borrow from, from some myths. And I'm sure that there's plenty of other cases where someone with a, a good uh, studying of mythology background could probably like pick apart all of like the movies and be like, well, they borrowed this idea from here. They borrowed this idea from here. You know, there's a reason why and maybe not in the MCU, I can't think of, of it necessarily, but in so many of like the, the Superman movies, he's always falling to earth with his arms out in like the shape of a cross. And, you know, there, there's often this borrowing of mythic imagery into superhero movies, but we have just a straight up copying and pasting of, of myth- mythic imagery. Um, do you think that they do my great, great grandfather justice? <laughs> well, let's not talk about justice in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. <laughs> Different league there, yeah. Um, so that that is, it raises a really interesting question because I mean, even the Norse pantheon in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, somehow there are attempts to connect it through kind of techno babble and and you know cosmo babble uh, to a a you know an all encompassing 
rules of physics apply, you know, unified theory that brings all these all these different stories together. Um, and in general, one of the I mean, one of the challenges, even just if we're talking practically uh, about choreography in any one of these scenes where these heroes start combining in the, you know, the mainline Avengers movies, uh, standardizing their power set, having huge disparities somehow translate convincingly on the screen. Um, and yeah, it's it's interesting, the, the theological uh, implications for that, because I mean, certainly in a uh, you know, in in a, a monotheistic tradition like Christianity, there is a you know a very decisive otherness to God power, right? And so uh, there there is there there can be degrees of intervention, you know, and and uh, conversations about the, de the the degree to which uh, the Son, the and the Holy Ghost, and the and the Godhead, of course, uh, that that's a big argument, right? About how much of that is transferable, what precedes what aspect, um, but there's still a, a clear. Uh, a clear distinction that even isn't even just a matter of degree. There's a qualitative difference between God power and mortal power. And this approach that uh, it creates a, a natural continuum between a character like Thor and a character like Iron Man uh, attempts to standardize that uh, the, the relationship between those types of power. Um, yeah, I don't know. Do you think that do you think that holds up? Do you think that that does those ideas? Yeah. Well, and I, you know, I can't help but think as you, you talk about standardizing power about how they separate Thor from the rest of the event, uh, like Avengers, until the end of Endgame because, or of, of not of Endgame of, um, Infinity War. Gosh, um, <laughs> but they they separate them, or they separate him for like this, you know, big final blow to show that he really was the strongest. He was the only one that really stood a chance against Thanos, sort of thing. Uh, but you know he um, he didn't quite make make enough of it. And then and then in the next movie he you know has the um, basically depression uh, stopping him from from having his full power. And so they you know they they maybe in a movie they find a way to take away a little element of power to make them uh, a bit more a bit more equal. Uh, and it's interesting though that you talk about like the um, you know it, it makes me wonder is, is there a god in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Like, what does, there, it's not really touched on. They're slowly with like the, the whole implications of the snap. They're slowly like getting into like the day-to-day -day lives of like average people and like how that has impacted them. But like, you know, so is, are there like practicing Norse pagans in the Marvel Cinematic Universe that are like, heck yeah, turns out we were right. Thor is right here. You know, <laughs> um, you know what, what do, the church, what is what does the Pope of the Marvel Cinematic Universe say when a literal, you know, Asgardian god comes down to to defend the planet? Or, you know, what is what are the implications on on the real, actual imagined religion? Or, or what what if is there is there still like some divine other who created all of this and who created Thanos, created Asgard, created, you know, there's um, gosh, there there could be uh, that that could we could spend the remaining like thirty minutes just talking about that question, <laughs> um, but and, and it, it reminded me of I was I was I interact with all the odds and ends corners of YouTube, um, and uh, I had recommended to me a video that was like, um, you know, basically that these they were kind of giving this this evangelical Christian channel a hard time. Like, because they wouldn't watch WandaVision because they believed that it was witchcraft that was going to like influence. And I mean, as somebody who grew up not being, being able to read Harry Potter, like I understand that world, uh, but that they wouldn't watch WandaVision because, and they had not had a problem to her previously, but now that she was like officially a witch, then that was a, a crossing a line in their, their like ethics as evangelical Christians. And, you know, so like, what what do you know? Do the do the evangelical Christians of of the Marvel Cinematic Universe? Do they like are they petitioning to Congress saying you need to kick Doctor Strange and Scarlet Witch out of our country because you know they're like, like what does it even look like? We start to get some insights into like the politics and into the, the the culture in the later movies, but like they're they're only just beginning to scratch the surface of like the, the fact that there's people uh, impacting it um, and. We, we touched briefly on 
like the the villain versus hero thing with Loki. But you know, there, it's kind of the joke, that, and I've seen it in, in meme form that you know they. Um, I haven't watched a ton of the, the newest, the Falcon in Winter Soldier, but he, uh, the the bad guys are these super. From what I gather, the bad guys are these super soldiers who uh, are work, like are upset with like a bad response to like the basically the refugee crisis that was created by the the snap to return everybody to life after five years, and so. Um, but the thing is, is that then they just start randomly murdering people for kind of like no reason. So there's this joke that like Marvel will give the the bad guy like a somewhat um, like reasonable thing to be upset about. And then they just start murdering everybody for fun. Just to, like make us like uh, it was the same with Killmonger. And uh, I mean, of course, they gave him the name Killmonger <laughs> um, it went in Black Panther or it was the same with like Zemo and civil war that like his family died. And so he was upset about this. Um, but then, you know, he does, what does he do instead? He just starts like murdering random people just to get the Avengers attention. Like it, they do have this tendency to like try and very clearly be like, these are the bad guys. See, they're killing the people. Um, and I think that was one of the things that people found interesting with like infinity war was that, that they kind of portrayed Thanos in like a, uh, a regular people sort of light like look he's just struggling and working on this burden that he has of uh, trying to deal with overpopulation um, you know so there um i don't know uh, if everybody is well well versed in the the term malthusian but it's the malthus was this this person who theorized about like that the earth was overpopulated and that we'd run out of resources and so Thanos is very much espousing like a real world belief. You have lots of folks that, that talk about how, you know, we're basically endangering the world by continuing to have children. Um, uh, but it's often at least, you know, it's interesting that his, his thing is pretty much the, there's no bias to who it takes out. It just takes out half of the world uh, of all of the universe. Uh, but uh, whereas in normal reality, a lot of that plays out in very racially biased ways that it's like, ah, Africa and Asia, they're really just making too much population. Uh, and so, you know, it, it's interesting how everybody found him, this guy who's espousing this thing that's basically killing half of the world to be like this somewhat sympathetic uh, figure. Um, like a, it was an interesting time to suddenly be like, see, this, this bad guy, he's just kind of a normal person. Um, uh, yeah, uh, any, any thoughts there on the, the Malthusian-ness of, of Thanos' plan? Yeah, uh, I mean, any, any time that, uh, you know, any time a, a supervillain or, or, or a major antagonist is given a sort of, uh, you know, possibly sympathetic side or an, an appeal is made for the audience's uh, sense of complexity, at the at the end of the day, it still it still has to be compatible with a punch out, <laughs> you know. That's what it has to amount to, and so I think that um, it's as much as they may present sometimes an illusion of a a normal tortured um, humanish <laughs> or humanoid character um, with these burdens with these pressures. Uh, exerted on them and with this accretion of bitterness and resentment um, narratively they're always going to have to be working backwards from the dramatic statement that draws that clear line of delineation that you talked about from you know in interesting you know modest proposal uh, to actual you know genocidal maniac and so uh, the the imperative to draw the heroes into combat you know that is the that is the visual language of 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 these films um that is always going to require that the uh that the the threat outstrip dramatically <laughs> any any human element in the villains and so you sometimes do see this this weird sudden leap from what what seems to be a a 
decently connected chain of reasonings and and resentments and frustrations and disappointments to suddenly well the only obvious expression of those things the only possible way that those negative feelings could culminate is in mass destruction right you know and <laughs> because because we have to have the fight scene and that's i mean that's a that's a difficulty um in diversifying the skill sets and the personalities of all the the good guys too, the good guys, the Avengers as well. You know, we, we see them, we see them in the medical profession. We see them in big tech. We see the, you know, high schoolers. And at, ultimately though, their skill is going to have to lead them to acts of physical confrontation and violence. <laughs> and most importantly, many New Yorkers, <laughs> um, <laughs> or at least New York face. You have Dr. Yes. Strange out of New York. You have Spider-Man, Iron Man lives in New York. And, Captain America. Yeah. Yep, Captain America. He was frozen off the coast of New York for a little while. Yeah, from Brooklyn, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, the real connecting thread here, the real reason why we can be hosting this at our, at our New York congregation is because we understand like the, the home of superheroes is New York. Um, so like one of the things that we had talked about is like something to consider is, and you talked about that we have all these characters with these different kind of backgrounds is, uh, you know, I, I suppose that's a way to like have us sympathize with them a little bit, but we have uh, those who born, are born with the powers, uh, uh, some some retroactively that happens uh, um, spoilers happens in wandavision uh, and uh you know so you have those that are born with the powers uh thor who loses it but gains it back um i'm trying to think of other good examples of of born with the powers or some have like this more earned and inherited like black panther and thor maybe more in that sense that like they were set to inherit this but then they lose it for some reason and then they earn it back uh, but then you also have those that that buy their powers or like have technology to to use their power to gain their powers you know it's it's interesting that like there's such a diverse group of like how they ended up at these places um in in the superhero narrative and, and it seems that they're only heading in the direction of kind of opening that up a little bit more as you have uh, folks like um, the new Miss Marvel, uh, who at least in the, in the comics was uh, a Pax, I think Pakistani um, immigrant family and she gets exposed to this mist and then decides to like become a superhero because she loved Captain Marvel in the universe. And so now, now that we've had this whole generation of the series, you have the heroes that are coming up, like you, you had it with Spider-Man, these heroes that are coming up where they've They've, they're inspired by the previous superheroes. Um, so we also have like this uh, replacing the, the next generation sort of thing going on. Um, why, why do you think it's so important for them to have such a, like a varied group of, of, of heroes who have so many different ways that they came into these powers? I mean, I, I definitely think, uh, for, you know, it's it's prudent from, if you're going to be cynical, it's prudent from a business perspective. There's something for everybody. Everyone has their avatar on screen. Or anyway, that's the that's the attempt. There, there, are, there are ways in which we all know that they let the side down on that and that in, they are, uh, you know, in some ways, clumsily, self-consciously attempting to, to better that. Um, but I, I, I mean, I also think it again, it comes down to a certain visual dynamism in those scenes where they, where they congregate. Uh, I think that also they're in, in, a, in, a, in a more interesting way, it makes for fundamentally different story structures. I mean, I mean Black Panther really stood out to me uh, as the first time in a little while that it felt like we got a film that roughly stood on its own without reference to the, you know, the mainline uh, plot. And it was because we were, yeah, we were seeing something uh, refreshingly different from a structural standpoint um, that did follow directly from how he got his powers. This is a statesman, this is, this is royalty. Um, and whereas Thor gives us the, you know, the look of the, the bad boy who doesn't quite ever really anticipate when he's gonna get to, you know, get daddy's scepter. Um, by the time we get to the start of the Black Panther movie, there's already been a regicide. He has already had to undertake that that mantle. And that has instantaneous, uh, real structural meaning for the 
progression of that of that story. There isn't the we for instance, there isn't the part where we see him uh, you know, messing about with his webbing powers in his bedroom and trying to develop some finesse with that. We've we've bypassed that part because this is a this is an, an individual who has been reared to live up to this occasion. You know, so I think that uh, different circumstances, different relationships with these powers, different levels of surprise or um, or pursuit in in acquiring them uh, actually inevitably just makes for completely different narrative experiences. Now, what what do you think? Is that are there are there ones that have uh, stood out to you in that respect? No, I think that that makes sense, and I remember how at the time how interesting Guardians of the Galaxy was because it was. Uh, different than than the things that had been done for with very different characters coming from very different places, a, a walking tree, a, a raccoon, uh, who we still don't know quite where he came from. Uh, and so I, I think it is important to have uh, a variety of heroes, both from this marketing perspective, but, you know, there's a, there's a reason why, whether it's all the Catholic saints or the Greek gods or any pantheon of gods that they always like, represent different parts of life like that that's oh that's that's what's needed for for humans to like understand the world around us is to have these characters that represent different parts of of life and different uh things that we're going to come in conflict with i think that one of the things you know i i know at the beginning i critiqued the individualism of loving superheroes and of much of uh american culture but i i will say that the mcu um, definitely drives home, I think, this, this, obviously the connectedness in the sense that all the movies come together, uh, but also like that these h- heroes begin to like have relationships with each other and like friendships and connections. Um, you know, sometimes it communicates better on screen, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, but, you know, that these, you know, when, uh, when you have uh, Black Widow's death in Endgame, spoilers, <laughs> should have warned about spoilers at the beginning of the video and the, the event um sorry about that everybody there will be some occasional spoilers if you haven't seen in game like three years later um <laughs> two years later i guess uh, but so um you know that that everybody says oh does she did she have a family oh we, we were her family sort of thing and that doesn't seem like too out there that seems relatively earned that they have built up this this family, um, you know, even in the first Avengers movie that that it's about not just having a team of like five superpowered individuals, like the, hey, the, the DC extended universe has that. Um, but it's about having them uh, function together as a team to overcome the challenges. And yeah, sometimes it's not conveyed the best, but at least like there's an attempt to show that like, that they're sure these are these superpowered individuals Sure, these are these individual things we can strive for, for, but like ultimately, we are better together. Um, you know, it, it it seems that there is a, a grounding in connectedness and family, even if um, superhero genre can be so individual. What are you, are there any examples that you can think of in like the series that really hammer home this family? Oh yeah, oh I I, I agree completely, and I actually I think that. Um... As frustrating as it sometimes became increasingly, if you were a particular fan of, uh, of a given hero or, or franchise to see that become kind of diluted and subordinated to this mainline larger crossover event. Um, if anything, that did really, really mitigate that, that sense of the, um, yeah, the, the go it alone exemplary individual uh, because in one another's company, it becomes uh, I mean, not just more effective to get the job done, but it becomes increasingly uh, it becomes increasingly less striking that any one of them can hover or <laughs> lift heavy objects or move super fast. Um, it it yeah, I mean, in a in the most positive ways, it becomes less and less kind of uh, impressive when they're in aggregate. They are they are no longer these these standout exemplary individuals and uh, that allows you to sort of just contextualize it as well how much of that was really to their credit in the first in the first place they many of them in in the right place in the right time born in the right circumstances happen to be gifted with whatever allows them to produce these effects 
um, the scene for me that most uh, most uh, is kind of delightfully treats that dynamic with uh, irreverence and warmth is the uh, the party scene that they have in the start of Ultron after they you know they think they've finished off their last mission um, and I mean you can see them almost uh, well you can see them crafting their own mythologies as they retell their exploits to party goers um, sometimes in <laughs> you know vulgar and, and casual fashion fashion leading to a punchline but still you can you can you can see the uh, the domestic side to uh, to to these adventurers you can see them almost in a in a hilariously desecratory fashion using their powers for uh, you know party tricks to, for for you know conversation pieces <laughs> you know uh, the argument over why why people can why why no one but thor can lift the hammer for instance is it really is there really a, a uniform worthiness metric that they're not meeting you know i mean i think i think that uh, that scene really does bring home that uh, notion of family for me the idea that relationships like that can exist post-adventure, post, uh, post-violence, post really. Well, uh, I have a question about Ultron, but we can we can get to that in a second. I just want to let folks know we got maybe like one or two more things that we're going to reflect on. Uh, but if you leave a comment in the chat box, I know we already saw one about fan fiction that I want to definitely talk about. Uh, if you have a question, leave it in the chat box and Colin and I uh, will get to that. We do, we're going to talk about Ultron and maybe like one other, one other thing. So what I think that that uh, a lot of folks struggle um, with this this uh, the AI revolution the, like this is a common uh, sci-fi fear that that technology will overtake us and you know we see it actually playing out in work automation overtaking uh, individuals working in factories and that that leads to loss of income versus more free time or something like that and so. Ultron is like the villain who literally lives out this fear that, you know, unfortunately he gets kind of the, the, the short end of the stick for, in terms of villain development, that he only gets his one video or one, one movie, despite being this huge uh, figure in the comics. Um, and, you know, he, it, it's, and, but then interest, I, I found it really interesting that as they got to end game, that suddenly you had Tony, being like, it would have been better if we had Ultron, basically. Like he was, you know, basically still arguing with uh, with Captain America, saying it would have been better if we had the shield around the world. Like, yeah, I may have screwed up with Ultron, but I, I was right that we needed this, you know. So is, is there a fair reason to worry about artificial intelligence as human beings? Are we going to be replaced by robots, Colin? So uh, this is something that actually occupies a lot of my headspace. Uh, every time, I'm, I mean, I'm I'm an actor. That's my vocation. Besides from my work at Fourth U, and every time I see uh, a CG rendering of a deceased actor, or even an actor that's just a little older than they had use for for the given film, uh, I, yeah, I think about that. I I'm I'm not necessarily sold on the idea of you know true computational intelligence being being managed i think that there is a, there's an organic component that you know a neuroelectric component that we're still very far from figuring out so in terms of of you know generating consciousness and sensation i don't know that we're um on the approach there uh, there's a little bit of ambiguity uh in things like star wars and marvel about the degree to which it is assumed that that has been achieved as well, even in the most convincing uh, Android characters. But I do think that if any if if anything can stay that uh, supplantation, it's uh, it's <laughs> learning to read one another's humanity better. You know, it, yeah, it does it does really bother me um, that we can be that we can be duped by online interaction you know that that we're all susceptible to that and uh and i i want to believe that there is a way to to train not just our 
detection of each other's human element, but our willingness to express it, uh, you know, unambiguously for each other. That's uh, from an artistic <laughs> humanist, <laughs> no pun intended perspective. Uh, that's that's uh, the, on the only really long-term remedy that I can think of. And I like to think that that uh, franchises like this can be a, a reason to gather, a reason to communicate as we are, as we are doing, um, to, to share stories and spread them. It's always complicated by, it, by the distributor being this growing conglomerate, uh, you know, tastemaker of, uh, of a company though. Yeah, I don't know, what do you, what do you think? Is there, are we, are we, on, the, are we on the edge of the, uh, of the singularity, what do you think? I sure hope that they don't come with an artificial director of religious intelligence. We don't need, you know, I need my job, don't take it. Um, you know, luckily it shows a field not so easily replaceable. I'm having occasional freezing. I don't know if it's uh, on my end possibly. I don't, if anybody's having issues with me freezing, please let me know. Oh, I haven't um, seen you freeze. You saw okay. me freeze a couple of times. Just like once. Um, oh, okay. But, yeah. Uh, so it goes with uh, any time that you're on Zoom for an hour, it's going to happen at least one time. Um, yeah, there you go. Yeah, you know, I, I, you know, I think that we we see like the the dangers of AI playing out in like social media. As somebody who's had a back and forth relationship with social media this last year, <laughs> um, that um, you know, gosh, I, I watched as I took. Uh, no approach to uh, that I wasn't on any social media except for YouTube for occasional videos suddenly YouTube was really floundering for like what to send me what would their AI algorithm send me because I wasn't they didn't have all of my information from the rest of the internet to be grabbing like they couldn't connect to my Facebook and see like hey look this is what she's been talking about on on there and so it it, it is I think increasingly dangerous in that sense that you have AIs that are being programmed to basically package everything about our personality into an easy to sell like distribution. I think that's a, a real danger that people should be worried about. And I, I do think that as people are concerned about justice, that, uh, that we should be thinking about how artificial intelligence can help people versus, uh, and to think about the ways that it may fall short. Um, Cause like, you know, it doesn't, automation of factories doesn't need to ruin people's careers. What it should instead be is that our society and our world can function better because we don't have to have people in these dangerous roles because we can have artificial intelligence do it. Like that, that, that would not be a bad thing. But unfortunately with the way that our world is set up that, that does not seem to be the case. Um, so I, I think artificial intelligence brings us good and bad um, villains and uh, <laughs> heroes. I mean, we had it. We had a vision, uh, artificial mm -hmm. intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah. um, I want to please leave a comment in the chat if you do have a question. Uh, I might talk about vision in just a second, but <laughs> let's get uh, Melanie's question about fan fiction. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as um, someone who chose um, Hermione as their middle name before <laughs> J.K. Rowling went very transphobic. Um, I have um, embraced fan fiction in that world as a way to still enjoy the characters sometimes and um, uh, not have the, the burden of feeling like, ah, oh, I'm engaging in the work of this person who is not very friendly towards trans people. Um, but I, I do find fan fiction to just be um, a really fascinating way for, for people to be interacting with these stories um, in all sorts of ways. Um, some not so friendly to talk about in this context than others. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think that it is, um, that it's, it's great for, um, for people to be engaging in their own myth. I know as somebody who grew up like with aspirations towards writing that like having that world of like online, um, fan fiction and writing helped me feel like I could do it too. Um, I did just see a great one that just came in about uh, Marvel's lack of LGBTQ representation. As you were talking earlier, Colin, with one of the questions where you, you said like that they you know have to get all the different markets, but sometimes they don't do that so well. Yeah. I, was, I wanted to be like, yes, like the time that they had the 
gay character because in Captain America's support group, someone says, my husband, <laughs> Captain America just nods and goes, okay. And like, you know, that that's it. Like that's, wow, thanks for, thanks for the representation guys. Like you yep. really went above and beyond. Um, I think that's where fan fiction helps. <laughs> um, if we can interlace these two, two connections together. Uh, you know, the good old, good old headcanon idea of being able to uh, tell stories about these figures, which I suppose lots of religions and myths have, have headcanons as well. Um, <laughs> but I do think that it's, it's definitely an area that, that Marvel could, I think, do a little bit better. Um, you know, I, 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 I saw that Pixar is looking for uh, uh, an actress to play a trans like teenager. So I, like, uh, I, I trust Pixar a slight bit more than I trust Marvel to do it well. I don't know if like I, how, if I would expect Marvel to pull off like a trans superhero very well, they'd probably have it be like, you know, Presto Changeo or something like that. And it'd be some horrible, like, oh, look how inclusive we are. We, we cast Caitlyn Jenner as, as Presto Changeo. Um, you know, they, they, I feel like, yeah, they, they try and do well. And like, I think that's also just a problem with Disney a lot of the time in general is like, I think about like Pixar where they're like, ah, yes, the, um, the, whatchamacallit, um, the, one of the monster cops, uh, and on, or no, that was onward. So that was Pixar too, I guess. Um, like, but lots of these Disney movies where they're like, ah, oh, see, look like, uh, in Star Wars in this, in this one shot, there's, there's two women kissing in the background here. So I think Disney has a long way to go towards that. And I think just towards, um, you know, I think that it helps when they get directors and such that are from marginalized communities. Like I think we see that with like Black Panther. Supposedly I hear good things about like that the Eternals is going to be very different. Like, and they have the director, the Asian American director of Nomadland for that. Um, like, so I think it's great that they're bringing that in, but it'd be great to also have some folks in the very, very higher levels of the planning go into that. I think that Marvel would stand a better chance than, um, maybe something like Star Wars, where there does not seem to be a lot of forethought. Um, but like Marvel could like, you know, prep it in there a little bit that, um, I don't know, like Captain Marvel seems like it, like she would be a solid, um, bisexual character i don't know like um just just I'm, I'm i'm reaching there but yeah i i would like to see marvel do do better on that front for sure um yeah no i that's what i certainly and i think that uh like you say marvel's maybe a better candidate than something like star wars in a galaxy far far away because i mean as we saw with winter soldier and uh and the and uh falcon that if for those of you who did see that most recent installment which i watched in preparation for this it was work um <laughs> you know i mean the marvel the marvel universe does it takes place on planet earth and it has less of a you know less of a easy excuse to not engage with uh, you know current motivating issues and unresolved issues and the uh, conversations that are overdue uh, it's a good uh, it's a it's a it's a strong vehicle for it and i'd like to see them tapping it in its full potential in that respect um, also on the, I'd like to say real quick on the, um, on the fan fiction note. Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, you know, there's, there's so much of it and it is almost, you're, you're very likely to, uh, if you were to click on a random effort in that respect, find something, um, that you might that might be disagreeable either from an aesthetic perspective or just a personal relationship to the given franchise or series perspective um but i find a hard time knocking it on principle because yeah i mean just to the the total top down power structure of canonical storytelling at the most visible blockbuster levels um is uh you know it's it's not it's non-negotiable at that scale for the people that support it by watching it and paying to see it or paying to read it and i think that um any way that that process can be democratized uh, any way that that can be a, a direct hands-on creative you know personal myth building experience i think that that's i think that that's largely a positive a positive 
thing, a, a, a positive avenue for us to, you know, take some ownership of the characters and the and the worlds that change hands so often and even even the best attempts to create a kind of canonical backbone for these extended universes can go astray because you know they try to revive them after a generation and and change directors three times in the course of one trilogy for instance and uh, so yeah i'm uh, i am i'm on principle uh, on board with the idea of engaging with these stories however however a person likes yeah um, so I, I do see Melanie that you got your hand raised. We'll, we'll get to you in a sec. I want to, um, uh, before we turn off the recording, I want to uh, mention that we will probably not be having any of these over the summer. Uh, there's, I mean, there's a chance that Colin and I are chatting one day and are like, hey, what about this pop culture thing? Or if somebody has a submission that they'd love us to talk about, please do. Uh, we're in talks with actually uh, a student who uh, really loves Rick Riordan and talking about maybe doing a Rick Riordan in theology in the fall. We are planning a Pokemon in theology probably in the, the fall winter time. Uh, and there's there's quite a few that we're looking at already. Uh, I know we've talked about Dune as a possibility uh, with that coming out. So we, we love doing these. We love hearing from you all, whether that's uh, here in person or on YouTube in the future. 